Our gospel reading today comes from St. Luke chapter 1 and verse 39. And Mary arose in those days and went into the hill country with haste into a city of Judah and entered into the house of Zacharias and saluted Elizabeth. And it came to pass that when Elizabeth heard the salutation of Mary, the babe leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Ghost. And she spake out with a loud voice and said, Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb. And whence is this to me, that the mother of my Lord should come to me? For lo, as soon as the voice of thy salutation sounded in my ears, the babe leaped in my womb for joy. And blessed is she that believed, for there shall be a performance of those things which were told her from the Lord. God's word for his people. Thanks be to God. Author of the book, Rediscover Jesus named Matthew Kelly, said this, God wants to teach you to dance. Now, some of you may be taken back a little bit by that. But uh, the, the, the resounding theme of the message this morning is God wants to teach you to dance. Now, some of you, I don't think God's going to have to do a whole lot of teaching because I've seen you. Now, I'm going to call somebody out here and they might shun me after this. But when Michael Zerby got married a few weeks ago, I saw a wonderful couple in our church do what I think they call the shag, the Carolina Beach shag, Tony and Linda, on the ballroom floor. And they were quite the dancers. Fred and Ginger, I believe we should probably start calling them. So it was really thrilling to see them out there having a good time. And uh, we, we left before it was over, so I don't know if Bill and Sherry got out there or not, but I did see Tony and Linda. So some of you might be quite the rug cutters, I don't know, so maybe the Lord is not going to have to do quite as much teaching as he might the rest of us. Uh, maybe some of you are saying, well, I don't know about now, but back in the day, you know, but uh, the Lord, God wants to teach you to dance. You ever really observe children? Um, children dance. Boys, girls and there's not a whole lot of inhibition there, like there is, you know, as you get a little older. Children will dance for all sorts of things. In fact, uh, I know that last year, um, my kids were over at Farm Life, and they, you know, they had this thing where about every hour they stopped and they did a whole class little dance. I don't know what you call it, Kim could probably say, but there was a little video, and they got up, and the hall, all, everybody in the class was dancing. Just having a good time, just a little break, I guess, from the academics. But kids, kids dance for all sorts of things because there's a happiness inside them. There's a joy within them. And, you know, about seven days from now, as little buddy reminded us, there'll be a lot of kids doing a dance, won't there? Some of you think back to when your kids were small and you woke up Christmas morning or whatever tradition you might have had. And, uh, you know, our tradition is that all, all the kids sleep in Maddie's room and the older she gets, the less she really likes that. But they all sleep in Maddie's room and they're camped out on the floor. And then when it's time, you know, about 5, 36 o'clock in the morning, uh, I've gotten up and kind of set everything up, got the Christmas tree on and the coffee brewing and all that stuff. And then we open the door. And we're, whoa, 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 wait, 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 wait. Go use the bathroom real quick. You know, so they run to the bathroom uh, and then they all come running out and there's some dancing that goes on. You know, so it's a wonderful thing to see. Um, I, you know, Jesus said um, we we're to have faith. Like a child. Didn't. And you know there's a lot of different ways you could go with that. But I think one of them is just that, 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 that brightness, that joy, that happiness that children have. About sometimes the littlest of things. You know God wants to see that in us. God wants to teach us to dance. Now there, when you consider that, that thought. There's a couple stories from the Bible that come to mind. Um, one of them is from the Old Testament. Uh, I was looking last night at a timeline of the life of David, king of Israel, the great king. You can Google it. 
You can, you know, look it up on the Internet and there's just a timeline. And man, he had an eventful life and it was up and down. And some of the things that that he dealt with in his life were his own fault. You know, because of his sin, we're we're reminded of the sin of Bathsheba and and, uh, with her husband, Uriah, the Hittite and all of that. Uh, He experienced great triumphs, great successes. He experienced times of poverty. He experienced times where members of his own family were hunting him and, and going against him. You know, it was really an up and down roller coaster life, a very eventful life. But it was up and down. It was a roller coaster. There's no doubt about it. Now, one of the particular uh, stories that, that, that is in the scriptures in Second Samuel is about when David wanted to return the ark to Jerusalem. You know, the ark was that chest that was laid in gold and it contained uh, the, the tablets of stone that Moses brought down from Mount Sinai. All right, and the Israelites marched with it for 40 years in the desert, and then they brought it into the Holy Land. And that thing had the power to level armies. David wanted to see it return to Jerusalem. It had been at somebody's house. And the whole time it was there, man, that family was being blessed like you wouldn't believe. And David said it needs to be brought back. And so David and some of his companions went and they got it. And the Bible says when they went six paces with it, that he stopped and he did sacrifices. And you know what he did? He danced. He danced with all his might, the Bible says. He danced. And then he went forward with singing and hymns and trumpets with that ark going into Jerusalem. Now, another story is one we just read from the scriptures here, which is fitting for this time of year at Christmas from Luke. Donnie and Debbie in the Advent candle reading read about when Gabriel came to Mary and announced that she would bear the Son of God. And she became pregnant without ever knowing a man. The Holy Ghost came upon her and she became pregnant with the child that would be Jesus the Christ. And the Bible says that she went then into the hill country. You know, there was all kinds of things that she uh, would be concerned about being a, a, a pregnant woman before she was officially married. She was betrothed to Joseph. But the wedding process had not been complete. And she had never known a man, but yet she was pregnant. And all those questions that she would have to answer. So she goes and visits her cousin Elizabeth in the hill country of Judea. And stays with her a while. And what I read to you earlier is this beautiful story of Mary. And you get this this vision of Mary kind of getting off the, the wagon or whatever form of transportation was there. And she, she begins to walk up to Elizabeth who is also pregnant. But her pregnancy is more advanced than Mary's. And the Bible says that as soon as Mary got close. The baby that was in her who would become John the Baptist began to leap in her womb. Now, another translation says, began to dance in her womb as Mary and the unborn child Jesus came close. Now, I remember when Nisha was pregnant with all of our children, and and, and some of you will remember this as well, about when the baby starts to kick and really move around and the woman gets all excited and calls the husband, Nisha, called me over. Come feel, come feel. It is really, a, it's a miracle. It's nothing short of a miracle. And you can imagine that Elizabeth, when, when, when Mary was just approaching and the baby's in there dancing. Almost like David did before that ark. Now there's something that both of these stories have in common. More so than just the dancing. Both David And the unborn John the Baptist began to move about with joy when they came into the presence of the Lord. The ark in the Old Testament represented the presence of the Lord. It was between the cherubims, which were on top of the ark, where the Lord's Shekinah glory abided when the Lord came to visit his people Israel. The ark was the presence of the Lord 
for the Old Testament people. And here comes Mary bearing God himself within her. And when she gets close, the baby begins to leap with joy in the presence of the Lord. And I want you to just kind of let that sink in a minute. That the, the joy that both of these individuals had when they were in the presence of God. Now, when you really step back and think about that, it's a powerful, powerful thing. How does one respond when they are in the presence of God, when they are in the presence of Jesus Christ? Now, we read through the gospel narratives and we see that when people became in the presence of Christ, when he walked on this earth, they responded in many different ways. Can you imagine what it would have been like to be Mary and Joseph as Jesus was a child and he went and he played about with the other children or did household chores like they would have been expected to do? Although he, they, they, they probably treated him in many ways like other children. He, the Bible is, is silent about much of his childhood. But we come to understand he grew up just like an ordinary person. But there had to be a joy there. As they were constantly in the presence with the living God made flesh. But when Jesus began his public ministry, many people would be in his presence. Some absolutely loved him. Some we would read would hate him. But never do I really remember reading of an individual who was completely indifferent now, maybe there were some in the crowds, kind of on the peripherals. But whenever we read a story in the Gospels about a person that has an encounter with Jesus, there is no indifference. It's generally one way or the other. Either they are in all of him. You think about the story of the wise men when they came to, to, to greet the baby Jesus and to present their gifts. And these were Wise, intelligent, kingly people, and they got down on their knees and were in all of him. You think about the woman who came and just fell at his feet and just poured oil on him and just washed his feet with her hair, just absolutely in reverence of him. You think of Thomas, who even after he doubted, when he realized that his Lord had risen, what is his response? My Lord and my God. What it would have been like to walk with Jesus down those dirty, dusty roads of Galilee and hearing him talk about the kingdom, hearing him teach the parables. It's just it's got to have been an unbelievable experience. There were many that loved him and recognized that he was something special, more than just a mere man, that truly the presence of God was with him. And they would come to realize that not only was the presence of God with him, but that he was God. But not everyone. Some would hate him. Some would fear him. Some would be jealous of him. Even when he was an infant, Herod the king, fearful. Of losing his power to obey. Willing to go and kill all the children in Bethlehem who were under the age of two. In hopes that he could wipe out this threat to his own throne. And then there were those religious leaders who responded with jealousy and malice. And at any time they could, they wanted to trip him up and engage him in some kind of conversation that where he would say something wrong that they could accuse him of. In one place, they were really willing to take him to the, uh, the, the edge of the city and throw him off a cliff. And eventually they were successful in turning him over to the Romans who would crucify him with criminals on Golgotha Hill. We read about Jesus encountering many people, many people being in the presence of Jesus, in the presence of the Lord. And although many would worship and many would revere and many would be in awe and joyful at his presence, there were some that were not. And so one of the questions that I want to raise with you today is how do you respond to the presence of God? Well, you say, well, pastor, 
Jesus isn't walking in and out of these doors. Jesus isn't walking in my place of business. Jesus isn't knocking on my door. Jesus isn't sitting beside me at Vera's. But didn't Jesus say, Lo, I will be with you always, even to the end of the world? Jesus says, I will not leave you alone. I will send my spirit. I will send my comforter. Let me tell you, I believe with all my heart, Jesus is here. We are in his presence, not just on Sunday morning, not just in the sanctuary, although he's here. But I believe with all my heart that Jesus walks with me and he talks with me and he tells me I am his own. Isn't that what we sing? When I go to work and I go to that school and sometimes some of the days are troublesome and you hear things and your heart breaks for some of the children and what they're going through and your heart breaks for some of the things they're doing. When you go to your place of business and there's all this 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 discourse and discontent. When you are riding up and down the street, when you're taking a walk, when you're out there with your pet, whatever you're doing, Jesus is with you. But how do you respond to his presence? Because I promise you it's there. I promise you it is. Jesus is with us. That's what he came to do at Christmas, to be our Emmanuel, which means God with us. And while he ascended to the heavens to prepare a place for us, he sent his spirit. And where there are Christians, there is the spirit of God. So how do we respond to this? David responded to the presence of the Lord by dancing. And I'm not going to try to trip you up, by, but he danced. John the Baptist, even before he was born, when he was in the presence of the Lord, he was dancing in Elizabeth's womb. They were dancing because there was joy. And I can tell you, at least I believe with all my heart, that no matter what your situation or circumstance, no matter what you're going through, you as a child of God can have joy. Now, I don't mean happiness because happiness does depend on our situation. You can be the best Christian in the world. If you get a flat tire, you ain't going to be happy at the moment. You can be the best Christian in the world and you go pay $15 for a steak and it ain't cooked the way you want it. You ain't going to be happy. But you can have joy even in the greatest struggle of your life because that joy comes from something that is not of this world. It comes from God. And so my second leading question this morning is what might be robbing you of your joy. What might be wrong. If, if that joy is there. And it's of God. What's keeping you. From dancing. To the joy that God brings. Could it be your. Own illness. Sickness. Or maybe another's. Sometimes going through a sickness with someone we love. Is even worse than going through it ourselves. Yeah. When we're involved in this and it's ongoing and long and it's a battle and a struggle every day, it, some of our joy seems to want to leak out. Or maybe it's just being consumed by the daily grind, working, paying bills, raising a family, dealing with all kinds of situations. There's always something that needs to be fixed. There's always a bill that needs to be paid. There's always a flat tire or a leaky faucet or, or a shingle that needs to be replaced. There's all, you always got to have a meal. You, everything can just be so overwhelming and consuming. And the holidays come and we have, we're supposed to have that joy, but it just piles on the responsibilities. Maybe our joy is beginning to leak out a little bit. Oh, Thanksgiving's over. I'm ready for Christmas by about the third week. Life catches up. Maybe we need to pray in faith that God will help us prioritize what's important in our life. So that the daily grind doesn't consume us and rob us of our joy. And you, you guys all could probably think of many other reasons why that joy may be leaking out. One that came to my mind this morning is, is somebody using you? And abusing your relationship. 
Maybe somebody at work, maybe somebody in the family, the community. Because that can that can tend to take our joy as well. And as helpful and as loving as we want to be, we're not to be taken advantage of. We're not to let someone else steal our joy. Again, there are many, many reasons. But God wants to teach us to dance. God wants us to live in the joy of knowing that He will never leave us. He will never forsake us. He wants to understand us to understand what Paul was talking about in Romans 8.18 when he said, For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. There is nothing on this world, I don't care how bad it is, that can compare to the glory that we will one day experience when we get in heaven with God. And for that reason alone, millions of Christians over the past 2,000 years have been willing to give their life and suffer innumerable amounts of pain and ordeals because they knew that when their eyes closed here, they were going to be in a better place. And for that reason alone, we can have joy. And we can have joy Because we know that no matter who we are, what we've done, who we've hurt, whatever sins we've committed, that God has wiped them away and washed us clean in the precious blood of His Son. That big burden of sin and guilt and shame that sometimes shackles us down, when we come to faith in Christ, He lifts it up and throws it away. And says, now, live in my joy. Now, there are some churches where they do a lot of dancing. It's a different type of church, different denomination, nothing wrong with it. I've been in some of those services and they're a lot of fun. And there are people with all their heart that are clapping to the music and dancing. And the spirit is moving in them. You may not be led to do that this morning. But I pray that in the coming weeks, months, and years, each and every day as you grow closer to Christ, that you will allow the Lord to teach you to dance. Because we got something to dance about. The joy of the Lord. May God bless you. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, teach us to dance. Sometimes we want to have a pity party. Sometimes we want to make excuses. Sometimes we want to wallow in what my dear... Pastor Stevie used to say, down in the mully grubs. But Lord, you have given us a reason to joy no matter what our circumstance. For we're looking to heaven as our home. You have saved us. You have cleansed us. You have forgiven us. And you have given us an inheritance that can never be taken away from us. God, help us dance in the joy of that. And may our dancing and our singing and our joy be infectious to this world around us. In Christ's name, amen.